Well, good morning and Merry Christmas to each one of you. Let's just uh, have a little word of prayer as we begin uh, this part of the morning. Father, we're thankful again for the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we have come to love him. We met him somewhere in our life's experience, those that claim to be Christians here this morning. And, uh, and we've just grown closer and more in love with him as we've learned more about him through our life's experiences. So help us this morning, just uh, a little bit more, some information uh, concerning the Lord Jesus that uh, we might leave this place really appreciating the Lord uh, just a little bit more. So we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, what a crazy year it has been. Who would ever have thought that as we came into 2020 on January the 1st, that before long, the chapel would have been locked up for weeks? Who would have thought the schools would have closed down? That most family and social gatherings have been limited or redesigned or rescheduled or canceled outright to accommodate COVID-19 and its restrictions? And I can pretty much assume that as we move into this Christmas season and Christmas celebrations, they too are going to be different than what we've ever experienced. But you know one thing that will not change? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. The story, the significance of Christmas, the Lord Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13. Now, it's a bit of a cliche, maybe overused, but the truth is, Jesus is the reason for the season. The laws of our province, the bylaws of our municipalities may govern how we celebrate the birth of Christ this year, but Christians around the world will focus on Jesus Christ and his coming as the babe in Bethlehem, the celebration of our Savior. As in the case of the shepherds and the wise men and Anna and Simeon in the early days, Christmas is a wonderful time. It's an opportunity to worship God's greatest gift to us in all of mankind, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, our text this morning is going to be found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And I'm going to read verse 9. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. The Lord Jesus Christ was rich. Ephesians 3 and 8 tells us that this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. He became poor and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. He came to this earth, they laid him in a feeding trough. He was born in a barn because there was no room for him. That we might become rich. Ephesians 1 and 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might be rich. Paul writes, for you know. We don't have to wonder if it was so. We don't have to question whether it is so. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
Now, in its simplest definition, grace means that it's God's unmerited, undeserved goodness to you and to me. In the context of 2 Corinthians 8, that the text comes from, it is primarily de dealing with finances, giving, and gifts, and the such. And what the word grace is bringing to us is the absolute generosity of the Lord Jesus Christ to give up his riches in heaven for each of us, for you, for me. He became poor for you and for me. Now there's nothing I can do to earn my salvation. There's nothing that I am merits his salvation. Ephesians 2 says, by grace are you saved through faith that is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So for a little outline this morning, we want to consider the prosperity of Jesus in heaven. We want to think of the poverty of Jesus down here on earth, and then the plan of Jesus, the riches that he has planned for you and I. The prosperity of Jesus. We read in scripture about the riches of his glory, the riches of his grace, the riches of his glorious inheritance. Now we don't possess a measuring scale by which we can get a full concept of the riches of Christ. We can't measure the riches of Christ. The other day I was hanging a picture for Nellie. She was on the phone and I didn't want to interrupt and ask where her tape measure was. So I picked up a charge cable from the table that was there uh, for her phone. And I thought, well, this is nothing to this, you know. So put the one end up to the ceiling, run my thumb down. Yep, thumb marks the spot over here, do it again. Well, you know, <clears throat> when I put the picture up, it wasn't level. And so when she got off the phone, I said, could I use your tape? Yep, yep, here it is. And when I had the proper tape with the graduations that you can understand in English, inches and such, I was 3 16 of an inch off because phone cables don't come with graduations on them. So when we think about the riches of Christ, my mind went to Solomon. Solomon was a man who they have said, people have said that he's the fifth richest man who has ever lived. And we get an understanding of those riches in the book of Kings and Chronicles, the gold that he brought in day by day and year by year, the silver, the, the land that he possessed, all of those things led to him being as rich as he was. But when it comes to measuring the riches of Christ, there is no bank statement. There's no land holdings that we can go to to try and determine the riches of Christ that he enjoyed in the heavenly places. We read in Psalm 50, the world is his. And we can hardly take that and try to take that in. The world, the place that he created, is his. Now, the songwriter put it this way He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. He owns the rivers and the rocks and rills, the sun and the stars that shine. They're all his. We can only speculate about his value. And we could start that by just going out and looking around at what he created. Amazing. The places you can go and just see the creation of God, undisturbed, undestroyed by man. And we begin to appreciate his riches. The 66 books that make up the one book, God's word, really completely are unable to bring to us the riches that Christ had. 
couple of years ago, I took a summer course at the Stratford Festival. Now, if you don't know, it's built around the writings of William Shakespeare. His plays, they're loved by most, hated by some, revered, examined, dissected, extolled, and performed. Books have been written about him. He has written books. But you know, his entire story is 52 years long. But in that 52 years, it has been thought that he is the greatest writer in the English language. Well, the story of Jesus goes from all the way from eternity past to eternity future. His heavenly glories, those riches, you know, for the most part, it was in our song, one of the songs this morning, are veiled from us. But one day we're going to see him. The hymn writer has said, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see, when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. What a day that will be. But you know, we can appreciate something of the riches of Christ even now as we start to think about him. I'm going to suggest that he was rich in relationship. Genesis 1 and verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. The unity, the oneness of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The relationship was there at the beginning of time, and we we can't go back into eternity. Our minds don't take that in. We work off of time. We know when it starts and it ends. John 17 and 22, 4,000 years after creation, Jesus said to the Father that they may be one, even as we are one. The relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our finite minds struggle to try and understand the infinite Godhead. Sometimes we teach children about an egg or an apple, trying to explain how three independent parts can be one. But you know, ultimately that example falls apart when you look at it carefully. The one, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one yet they're independent. They are different in some of the things that they're called to do. The Father is a spirit. And we don't read that he ever puts his feet down here as a spirit. Jesus, on the other hand, was seen in the Old Testament, made a few appearances. Also, in this season, we realize he came as a babe in a manger and ultimately, in his death, became the savior of the world. And the Holy Spirit made its presence known in the Old Testament, more involved in a hovering over people. But as we know, in the New Testament came and indwelt us as believers. Jesus was rich in relationship. He was rich in power, Hebrews 1 and 2, by whom also he made the world's. Hebrews 1 and 3, upholding all things by the word of his power. As God, as the God-man here on earth, he controlled nature. He raised the dead. He healed the sick. He fed the masses with virtually nothing. Isaiah would write, he measures all the waters of the earth in the palm of his hand. That the heavens from this to this are measured simply by the span of his hand. The sun, the moon, the stars, he made them all. The galaxies, he made them all. He was rich in power. He was rich in authority. He was born a king. Matthew 2 and 2, the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Philippians 2, 9 and 10, a future day, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, that every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
to speak of Christ's riches is to take the little thimble of our cup of understanding and dip it into the vast ocean of Christ's riches. But you know, our text further says, for your sakes he became poor. The poverty of Jesus. You know, the Christmas season seems to draw attention to poverty, the poverty around us. And I suppose the various charities are trying to capitalize on the giving nature of people at this time of the year. December 1st was designated as Giving Tuesday. And the radio and television and paper and social media emphasize the great need around us. Please send food donation, clothes donations, and cash. And there are many who seriously are in need. No one desires to be in need. Nobody desires not to be able to pay their bills and put food on the table. But you know, when it comes to poverty, the poverty of Christ, he willingly chose to come to this place that was not only devoid of riches, but in many cases devoid of necessities. He humbled himself. He made himself of no reputation. He took on himself the form of a servant. He came in the likeness of men. Who really has ever been born in a barn? You know, it's one of my dad's favorite terms back in when I was a kid. Close the door, were you born in a barn? Well, you know, if Joseph ever said that, the Lord Jesus said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I was born in a barn. Well, you know, the poverty of Christ, he would say the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but I haven't got a place to put my head. And you know, he wasn't talking about a, a isolated incident that he couldn't find a place to sleep that night. This world was just not his home. His home was in a very heavenly place where his father uh, dwells. You know, we can put a lot of money into a vacation. We can plan, we can hope, we can go to some place luxurious and, and just enjoy our time. But you know, after a week or two, it really just doesn't seem like home. It doesn't, it's not our bed, it's not our home. But you know, Christmas is all about the Lord Jesus Christ coming as a baby to Bethlehem. Deity and humanity fused together as one God who spoke the worlds into beings would now subject himself to human frailty, to hunger and thirst and exhaustion, to human emotions, to relationships, to love, to hate, to tears. It's hard to imagine the Lord Jesus Christ, born a king. One day he was running around with diapers on, learning to walk, learning to talk. All of these things he would have experienced, leaving the riches of heaven behind, he took on the poverty of this scene. He set aside those riches of heaven for his birth in a feeding trough. He faced no room in the inn. There was no room in man's heart when he began to minister. His parents were poor. They give an offering of a turtle dove. It's the, it's the, the, the least uh, offering that anyone could give to God. And it pictured the poverty of his own parents. There's no mention of a father after age 12. He could have been raised very easily by a one-parent family in Mary. He had brothers and sisters, we know. He didn't even have enough money to pay his tax, Roman tax. Some of the people that followed him that were his friends were prostitutes, ex-prostitutes and tax collectors, the low of the low of society. He made his grand entry into Jerusalem on Good Friday on a borrowed donkey. They buried him in a borrowed tomb. 
He died alone. The people he came to save rejected him, cried out for his own blood. And finally, he was rejected by God, and he died between two criminals. For your sakes, he became poor. You know, Jesus' coming was not sort of a last-ditch effort on God to try and resolve man's sin problem. 700 years before he came, Isaiah the prophet said that a virgin would conceive and bear a son, and his name would be called Emmanuel, God with us. 700 years before he came to this earth as a babe in Bethlehem, it was Micah who said that he would be born in that very place, Bethlehem. 4,000 years before he came as a babe to Bethlehem, God said the seed of the woman would crush the head of Satan. Isaiah also wrote that his name would be called the mighty God. His birth appeared like any other birth, but this child was not going to be like any other child. Isaiah and Micah wrote prophetically about his coming. Matthew and Luke wrote, wrote as though they were there and watched it and made a witness to it. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. So are you feeling rich this morning? Financially speaking, none of us are really that poor put on a world standard. None of us here. But the fact is, people are so comfortable and yet they're not happy in this world. They want more and more and more. But Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 that the Lord Jesus became poor so that we could become rich. And we're not talking finances now. We're talking the riches of Christ. That's God's currency that comes to us as a result of the Lord Jesus. You know, there are many examples of how we are rich. We read in Ephesians 3 that we are blessed with all spiritual blessings, as I read at the beginning. We have been adopted into the family of God. That little uh, Sunday school song that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills later would say that since we're his, they're mine. That's quite amazing, isn't it? We are in God's family. We have an inheritance which is ours. The fact that we can never, ever, ever be lost from the family of God. You know, those who have never accepted Christ as their savior are deprived of these riches. They don't understand them at all. They have no concept of the riches that you and I have in Christ. I'd like to look at just three in the moments that we have left. The riches that we have in life, the riches that we have because of our hope, and the riches that we have because of joy. Well, we learn about life in Ephesians 2 and 1. It paints a very solemn picture, of course, that each of us are dead. Speaking from God's perspective of things, we are born dead in trespasses and in sins. And we carry the judgment of our first parents, Adam and Eve, who sinned against God and who brought sin into the world. Both physical and spiritual death were instituted because of their disobedience. For the first time when they sinned, that they became aware of that sin. And what did they do? They tried to hide. And they're just like little kids. My dear son, who broke one of my non-treasured um, pottery motorcycles that I believe someone painted for me that, are, that isn't here today, 
you know, prominently sitting out there. And I don't know if he was throwing a ball, but you know, you sort of forget those kinds of things. They get put on the side someplace. And all of a sudden I thought, yeah, my motorcycle with me sitting on it was sitting there. But then I looked behind the couch and it was like, swept behind the couch, hoping that I wouldn't find it. Well, Adam and Eve tried to hide. They put clothes on for the first time when they found out that now something different had happened. They had sinned against God. As cute and cuddly as a newborn is, I just got grandson, and I can't even tell you what number, seven, eight, I can't remember now, uh, born a couple of weeks ago. Cute and cuddly, for sure. But you know, it's not going to be long before selfishness is going to kick in. I want what I want, and I want it now. And that little selfishness is going to turn into tantrums and screams and a lot of other things. And as kids grow up, they manifest their sin in different ways. And if they're not looked after when they're growing up, they're going to be adults and they're going to manifest sin in some pretty extreme ways. And David, King David in Psalm 51 knew that his sin was extreme. Murder, adultery. He says, I was born in sin and shapen and separated from God. Shapen in iniquity, separated from God. But God in his grace, that generosity that we mentioned earlier, has gone to great effort to restore what was broken in that Garden of Eden by our first parents. For death, he offers life. He offers us eternal life. John 10 and 10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So not just life that we sort of meander around this world like a, a boat without a rudder. He has come to give us abundant life that our little ship of life can be steered. But he doesn't stop there. Ephesians 3.20 goes on to the next level, exceedingly abundant life. Now that's pretty rich. And God has given it to us. For the punishment that we deserve, a substitute was found. And it was the Lord Jesus Christ. He died in our place so that we might have life. When we accept God's gift of eternal life, Romans 6 and 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. When we accept that gift, we have become alive in the sight of God. But it doesn't stop there. The moment that we become alive in the sight of God, the vault of heaven is opened up and the riches pour out. But we need to take those riches. They just don't get dumped on us and we live as some rich person born in a, a house of rich people. God has given us so much blessing. We need to take that blessing. We need to, to find it. We need to live in light of that blessing. You know, our physical life is very precious. For the most part, we nurture our physical life. We try to exercise. At least we know that it's good for us. We try to watch our diet. We know that certain things are not as good as other things. As we get older, all of a sudden, there's more sort of checkup visits at the doctors. We all do it to some extent. So if our physical life is that important to us, what about our spiritual life? Well, it's no different. We need to nurture our spiritual life. We need to, to realize what tremendous cost was involved to make it precious. If we think our physical life is precious, how much more our spiritual life? We need to feed that spiritual life on the word of God. We need to exercise in prayer. We need to be careful where we go. We need to be careful what we do. We need to be careful who we hang around with because some things are not gonna be helpful in the nurturing of our spiritual life. This morning, we spent a lot of time talking about the hope that we have. We are rich in hope, you know that. We are rich in hope. You know, the best our neighbors can hope for is a comfortable life, a quick and painless end to it with no thought 
of what's beyond the grave. But as believers, our hope is what really many times, and Stephen put it as good or better than anything I could ever say, that hope that we have, that can keep us from falling. And if things become so dark, so depressing, that hope that we have can give us life on the days when we feel the absolute lowest. That hope that we have can bring praise, can bring worship. It even puts a song in our lips at times. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We sang that this morning. What riches from God's hands. Hope for the present, salvation. Hope for tomorrow, that we're not going to be alone. And hope for eternity, that one day we're going to be in heaven. John writes, heaven's going to be a place where God's going to wipe away all tears. There's going to be no more death, no more crying, no more pain. And may I add, no more pandemics and mass in isolation for all those things are going to be passed away. This is part of the riches of God, our hope for the future. Romans 8.31 says, what then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? We're rich in life, we're rich in hope, but we're also rich in joy. Joy is part of the fruit of the Spirit that was given to us the moment we accepted Christ as our Savior. It comes with love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. Well, you know, COVID-19, that is a real test of our joy. The secular world is very worried about not only the immediate effects, but now they're seeing the long-term effects of COVID, of the loneliness of the physical, no physical contact. They're worried about mental illness and physical abuse in families and relationships, drugs and, and alcohol. But as believers, you know, we can't hide our head in the sand and try and say, well, this is nothing. It's just some big conspiracy because COVID is real and COVID kills. But the question is, what are we focusing on? You know, the radio, TV, media, they're going to have us fo focused on numbers and outbreaks and latest projections. And all of that is, if that's what we're filling our hearts and our minds with, you know, it's going to bring confusion. It's going to bring us fear. It's going to bring, it's going to rob us of joy that God wants to give us, the riches of joy. You know, God gave us common sense and a brain to use. We need not be careless, because that would just be plain foolish. So when I work in schools, there's a list of words I can't use. One of them is stupid. My daughter tells me I can't use that word. Unfortunately, I used it for a kid the other day who fell off his chair. I said, there's no mercy for stupid. Anyway, the class got a real joke out of that one. God has given us something to think with and to, to think this is all just a big farce is stupid. But paranoid is the other extreme that every person that we meet, every thing in the grocery store has been touched by somebody with COVID. Well, that's the other extreme. And that also can rob us of joy. You know, with God, nothing happens by chance. Is this the end? I don't know. Is this a dress rehearsal for what might be tribulation experience for those left behind? Or is this going to pass like the Spanish flu and the bubonic plague, sadly taking many casualties with it? To worry and fret, to have anxiety about it all, will substantially restrict the riches of God's joy. We need to primarily focus on what's above and what's ahead and not primarily focus on what is around us. Our joy is going to bring thanksgiving. You know that? It's pretty tough to wander around and give thanks to God when we're so dwelt, our minds are so focused on the disaster that we're facing in the moment, in the day, in the week. But joy is gonna bring worship 
and praise. And as I said about hope, it's gonna put a song on our lips. Even if we only sing in the shower, it's gonna put a song on our lips. We know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor that you, through his poverty, might be rich. Let me conclude with a text I got from Nellie the other day after she was meditating on Ephesians 6. The helmet protects our minds in light of the fear and confusion of COVID. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He didn't look at the circumstances around him. He knew the cross was ahead. That's something we don't know. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. But we know who holds our hand as the song goes. But we have a journey as believers in Christ. We have a journey. So let's not get sidetracked with things around us. Let's keep our mind on the things ahead of us. The breastplate protects the heart. With our hearts, may we show a, lo a loving kindness and understanding to others at this Christmas season. Our feet are protected, so that, therefore let's stand firm in the things that we believe. Stand firm, having the shield of faith, never wavering. Let us proclaim Jesus Christ as our Savior and celebrate his birth at this Christmas season. And then we have the belt of truth to guide us through COVID and beyond. We as believers are truly blessed. We are rich in life, we are rich in hope, we are rich in joy. The Lord became poor so that we can become rich. What an awesome God we have. What an awesome God we have. He is still on the throne and he is still in control. And let's never take our minds, our hearts off of that fact. Father, we are thankful this morning hour for the riches that we have in Christ. We rub shoulders with neighbors, with friends, with workmates, with classmates, with people in stores as we wait in line, total strangers that are standing there with no life, spiritual, no hope, and their joy is so small. And Father, we as believers have been given so much Father, help us to live in light of that. The vault of heaven open to us. And yet too often we just pick and choose the little things. We know that we're going to heaven, but look at the abundant life that you offer to us. And, and the vault has been open. And we need to live in light of all the blessings that you've given to us. Let it help us to take those blessings and make them real in our life that we might be the examples of Christ that others might see. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.